and then hand it over to Dave, who will then take you through um, some water quality information. So I'm just gonna dive on in here. So the most basic thing is understanding what a watershed is. As you can see in this photograph, we have in this region, rain that falls down out of the sky. There are other places where um, mist coming in from the ocean is the main source of water to the ecosystem. But in our area, we have precipitation. It comes raining down out of the sky. It falls on the ground. It lands on trees. It lands in the streams. It lands on buildings, etc. And the watershed is the top of the hills that surround an area that all of the water drains down through. So this is a really nice graphic of what a watershed looks like and not too different from what our watersheds look like in this part of Pennsylvania. So there's a couple of important terms that I want to uh, talk about in here. So here's our watershed boundary. That's gonna be the top of a ridge line. All the water that falls on the ground soaks into it. It works its way down into the streams. Anything that runs off during a heavy rain event, it's gonna work its way down into these streams. When two streams come together, there you have a confluence. All these little streams are the tributaries to the main one. In our case, the main one would be Darby Creek. And then we have probably about a dozen or more named tributaries that flow into Darby Creek. And then Darby Creek goes down and discharges through the John Hines Preserve into the Delaware River. So everything starts at the top of the watershed. So this is what everyone terms the headwaters, the very top edge of the watershed where you first start to get streams that appear. So the photograph on the left, I mean, it's a, it's a little bit small but these little green things poking up in there are skunk cabbage. This is a wetland area up in the top of a watershed in the headwaters area that then, typically it's either a place where rainwater accumulates and then slowly discharges to a stream, or it can be a place where groundwater is discharging just below the surface and down from these wetland areas like this on the left, you flow into, you start to develop these little tiny stream channels or little baby streams coming down through. They get larger and more water flows into them. You start to pick up shrubs in there and then eventually you end up with a nice stream. This would be probably just about wide enough that you could step across it and it might be a little more than ankle deep. This was when it was raining, so it's probably a little more than an ankle deep on the right hand side there. So where are we in context? <clears throat> we sit all the way down in the southeastern corner of Pennsylvania. Here's Delaware County right here. Here's the city of Philadelphia. This is Montgomery County. This is Chester County over here, and this nice curve down here is the top of Delaware. This is or the state of Delaware. This is the Delaware River that forms the eastern boundary of Pennsylvania. This is the Schuylkill River coming over here through Philadelphia, and Darby Creek begins right up in the top edge of Delaware, or excuse me, of Chester County, flows down across Delaware County into the pines and then into the Delaware River. So that gives you a little bit better feel for place. Uh oh, what happened here? There we go. Um, so we sit inside of the very massive Delaware River watershed. I didn't put on the statistics about the 20 odd million people that rely on it for drinking water, but this is more a discussion of land and how that interacts with water. So it's 14,119 square miles, which is nine over 9 million acres. So that may give you a better context because most people have some idea of how big the lot is that their house is sitting on. 
This is what the watershed looked like many, many, many years ago. And you can see a little bit of agriculture in the top right hand corner where we clear, started clearing the land to um, grow food. And most of that ended up close to streams. And you can see there's a stream along here. This is probably pretty close to a headwater stream. It may start somewhere up in this forested area and then discharge down through here. Farms typically picked these lower areas because they were flat and the water was usually a little more reliable than in the higher drier areas where the forest is. But we managed to clear a lot of the trees from our forests to uh, create charcoal and then lumber for buildings, et cetera. So we cleared pretty much all of Pennsylvania at some point in the past. So what our watersheds around here used to look like or this photograph on the left. That is a water, a uh, headwater stream. It has a drainage area of only about 100 acres flowing to it. That's a winter shot. And you can see that there are no real <laughs> steep eroded banks along the edges of it. It's nice and flat, the slopes coming into the, uh, the stream channel. On the right-hand side is a watershed with just about the same number of acres draining to it. It's on a college campus, so we chose to mow all the way down to the edge of the bank, and now it's just this squeezed little channel that flows through here and then down into a pond and then off of the campus. So we've altered our watershed substantially. And this is, this is always a really good slide to uh, talk from. What we used to have in the natural environment was about 25% of the rain that fell went into shallow infiltration, 25 went deeper. It's only about 10% that ran off of the land, 40% went back and the rest of it was used by, um, well actually this could be evapotranspiration because the plants were using up a fair amount of that and releasing it to the atmosphere. Now in our urban area, we only have about 10% going back into the shallow groundwater system, 5% deeper, 55% now is runoff and about 30% is evaporating off of these hardened surfaces. So the reason that the shallow infiltration is important is in southeastern Pennsylvania, all of our streams are what would be termed gaining streams. All of the rain that falls on the forest and the trees and the hills, a little bit on the lawns, soaks into the soil, flows down into the down deeper into the soil and then follows the topography or the land surface and ends up discharging into a stream. And as you come down through the watershed, there's more and more water that is added to the streams. That's why they get bigger and that's why they're termed gaining streams. So here's Darby Creek watershed. Um, I don't have the best labels in here. I couldn't scale them based on the length of it, but here's Darby Creek. Its headwaters are all the way up here at the top. A little bit of headwaters over here that flows into our largest named tributary, which is Cobbs Creek. Darby Creek and Cobbs Creek form a confluence down here just before it becomes tidal. All this portion of our watershed is tidal. And we do have some interesting little um, streams that are tidal down in the bottom of our watershed. And one of the things that I'd like to point out, and this will become more evident as we move through this, is up here we have a really nice, what they would call a dendritic seam stream network. All kinds of little streams that flow into bigger streams that flow into bigger streams. And we should see all these little tiny tributaries feeding into like Little Darby Creek. But we don't really have that over here. And I think we'll understand why as we move forward. Here are the uh, political boundaries that have absolutely no bearing on watersheds except for when a large river becomes a uh, boundary of a municipality. But this just gives you a better, a better idea of place and you can look at this map and figure out where you live relative to the Darby Creek watershed. So here is um, what I was alluding to earlier. This is the purple on this uh, figure 
is impervious surfaces. And I'll talk about what those are in a minute. But you can see that the lower part of Darby Creek's watershed from about here all the way down along the city of Philadelphia, I didn't get impervious mapping for the city of Philadelphia, all the way down to this big open space down here, which is the John Hines National uh, Wildlife Preserve. So there isn't any impervious in there. But you can see over here that a lot of this impervious has replaced all those little streams that were that used to be there. And up here, there's very little impervious. So you still have the little streams in there. So what is an impervious surface? An impervious surface is a roof, a driveway, a sidewalk, a parking lot, a building. It's a surface that when the rain falls, it hits the surface, it does not soak into the surface and runs off. So I think you can see from this picture that there are some places with some pretty serious impervious surface um, in pretty serious impervious surfaces, large parking lots, industrial areas, but even the driveway, even your driveway and the road out in front of your house are impervious surfaces. And now why, why would an impervious surface be bad? From a water volume and base flow in a stream's perspective, it's a bad thing because all of that water, instead of soaking into the ground and then working its way over and feeding into the stream at a constant 58 degrees, which is the temperature of groundwater discharging to streams, you have all of these <coughs> hot, during the summer months, we're coming into it, surfaces that the water lands on and immediately goes running off. So you have these massive pulses of storm water runoff that hit the streams, go flying on through it. In the summer months, they raise the temperature. In the winter months, they raise the uh, salt in the water. And so they're, they're a bad thing. Too much impervious surfaces is a very bad thing for a watershed. I'm gonna take you through a quick little, quick little tour of a, uh, yeah, here, of a watershed in, um, or a little small 500 acre watershed within Darby Creek's watershed. You can see in 1887, we're 10 large landowners. It was predominantly agricultural, a couple patches of forest in there. There were two streams and four springs. These little dots are where there were springs identified on this old 1887 map. There are only six roads and five farmsteads within this uh, area. This is what the road system looks like today. And, 2020. Um, really don't see any streams where roads are going around where these streams are. And now when you add the impervious to it, you can see that the streams have completely vanished. This is a, you can see this faint blue line going through here. This is an elementary school and there is no stream there. This is a ball field. So it's inside of a pipe. They piped it down here. It now runs along this road. So all, all of these streams are inside pipes in this little watershed until you get way down here at the corner where it finally gets to see the light of day again. So you can see the, uh, the nine, this was in the 1930s, 40s, and 50s was when most of this work went on. And during that time, Society thought that it was a good idea to just eliminate the streams and take all the storm water that hit the roof and the roads and put it in pipes and move it out so everybody, so no one had to get their feet wet walking to and from their house. Uh, now I'm going to flip back to our watershed. This is the headwaters area of Darby Creek. This is the very top. And this purple along here is all of the impervious that exists along. Lancaster Pike, Route 30, pick the name, <laughs> Lancaster Avenue. So this is Route 30 up here. This is where the blue route comes down through, 476. So you can sort of get a little bit of an idea of where you sit geographically without a lot of road names on it. So you can see that the upper part of this watershed is very impervious. <clears throat> the center part in here has wide open spaces and much less impervious and lots of little streams as opposed to the bottom of this watershed. So this is a picture of that little stream that I talked about that's inside pipes. And on the left-hand side, this is what it looks on, like on your average 
average day without any rain, nice little calm stream flowing through a golf course. We won't talk about the eroded banks and mowing to the edge right now. And on the right-hand side, that was a thunderstorm that came through. I went out right after the thunderstorm had passed and it's a raging torrent. So you can see, you know, base flow conditions on the left, a little bit of a rainstorm on the right. Same thing over here. And it this happens within that water in that channel appears at that large volume in about 15 minutes after the rain starts to hit the roads and the houses. So now we'll back up a little bit. This is um, this is a headwaters area. This is a stream that's going through here. It's um, at the very top, it's a headwater stream. And you can see that as the landscape above this, or I can see as the landscape above this was developed and became more impervious, the channel started cutting down because there's more stormwater going through it in a faster, shorter amount of time. And it's eroding the banks and the trees are starting to collapse and fall in on this. Farther downstream on that same tributary, we can see the, the practices that are really wrong for streams. On the right-hand side is, although there's a, there are quite a few invasive species in there, the right-hand side of that channel has at least a little bit of a riparian buffer in there where it's not mowed right to the edge. And you can see on this side that this is mowed right to the edge, and now we have this eroding bank it's very vertical. On the other side, you don't see that as much because we have the right riparian buffer holding it all in place. The, um, <laughs> so the, what happens is, is we have this eroding bank. People start to get um, nervous about the eroding bank. So the practice is we throw a bunch of rock on there put a little board across the top so everybody knows where the stream channel starts. And we start this slow degradation and elimination of a stream channel. So that's step one. Step two, you have people who put up fences and remove trees that are holding the bank together on this because they don't want their children to fall into this raging tor torrent of water during a rainstorm. Then we go a little bit farther, and as the watershed became more impervious, this became the practice. These are stone-filled baskets. They are about five feet high, so this is roughly 15 feet of vertical wall of stone here. And when there is a substantial rainstorm event, this is full nearly to the top of screaming, raging, gray-brown water. And over here on the left-hand side where these trees are, about 50 feet from there is the first house. So a riparian buffer needs to be 100 to 300 feet. So we're not even close. And then how do you overcome these vertical banks? This is how you overcome those vertical banks. You put up a giant concrete wall, and then behind the wall, you fill it with soil. I think this one's filled to about this point on these blocks behind here so that they can have a backyard that water never visits and it also gives them a place to take their kitchen demolition debris and their yard waste and dump it over the wall down against the stream and the next storm that comes through washes that away so it's their little trash disposal area and all it does is end up in someone else's yard farther downstream and then here is the conclusion this is in a neighborhood not too far, well, it's in, it's in our watershed. If anybody knows where the Quarry Center is on Township Line near Westchester Pike, the, um, up behind that, this stone wall here, <clears throat> excuse me, is a bridge abutment. So there used to be a channel back here where now there is a fire pit. And somewhere back up past this fence, you can actually see the, the, the open stream channel. But this is sort of the conclusion of, I don't need to have those vertical concrete walls or stone baskets. I'm gonna put a lid over it, cover it up with grass and make it into a yard. So 
<clears throat> the problem with those practices is, is we've eliminated all of these important natural resources that sustain our water and our water quality. And wetlands are where wetlands, I'm a wetland scientist, so I have been in and out of wetlands for decades. And wetlands are where the land and the water meet. They're not um, dry like land surface was, would be, and they're not always wet like a pond or a river or a lake would be. And you can see some of the beautiful flowering plants that grow in wetlands down here along the bottom edge. And wetlands are also where the wildlife flourishes. These little tadpoles on the left hand side are wood frogs in a vernal pool in a uh, wooded wetland. This big uh, snapping turtle here on the right appeared and the next fall we found um, baby snapping turtles in this uh, wetland pond that was created. So this is the place where life starts and where life is sustained for farther down in the watershed. So the food chains and streams um, a, a lot of people, and my early understanding was that it was the algae in the streams that fed the food chain and built fish for us to uh, eat. So as it turns out, one of the most important um, sources of food to a stream are leaves falling in from the forests. So if we take the forests away and we cover it with cut grass, we don't have leaves falling into the stream. The, the uh, leaves are ground up and eaten by the macroinvertebrates that live in there. Some algae grows on there, but the, on there, but the main source of the food chain in a stream are tree leaves and organic detritus that gets in there, gets ground up and eaten by the macroinvertebrates who then come in and they provide the food for the fish. And you can see over here, we have a scud down here, which is a grazer. It eats the uh, ground up bits of leaves in the stream. There's, I don't know, I, I don't do fish. So someone who does fish will be able to tell you what these various fish are coming up other than the gar up here. And then we have a uh, osprey who's at the top of the food chain eating that. So I'm gonna leave you with a couple of images from our watershed. This is uh, probably about the middle of the watershed, just down, just down from all of those, all of that open space in the top, in the middle part of the watershed, just before it dives into the highly urbanized area. And here's just driving back to our watershed. I believe that that photograph was taken right over in this part of the watershed here. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Dave, who, or David Bressler, who's gonna to talk to you about um, water quality and, ha and some of the important things associated with water quality. I sort of drove everything into the stream and the food chain, and now he's gonna explain what happens inside of the stream. Okay, hey, thanks, Darren. Everyone can hear me, I assume. Hi. Yes. <laughs> Um, so I'm Dave Bressler. I have been with Stroud Water Research Center for about four years now. Uh, I primarily work in the Delaware River watershed, working with watershed groups to build capacity, to do monitoring, and educate uh, the community. So as Darren mentioned, I am going to talk about water quality put my everyone can see my presentation oh wait did I share it let me share hold on I need to share screen first there all right please bear with us we're trying to work with the zoom and we're kind of <laughs> all new to this so bear with us all right so thanks Sue yeah um, so I am going to talk about water quality data. Um, so to start off, um, I'm just gonna give a little bit of an overview of what I'm gonna go over here. So we're gonna, I'm gonna talk briefly about, well, what are data? Um, and what's the purpose of data? Then I'm going to uh, 
introduce the um, project that Sue and Darren and Lauren and I have been developing to monitor the headwaters of Darby Creek. Um, Darren showed a map of those headwaters towards the end of his presentation. Um, as I mentioned, this is a collaboration between Darby Creek Valley Water uh, Association, uh, Willistown Conservation Trust, and the Stroud Center. And then I'm going to pass it off to Lauren, who's going to go into more detail about that project. Um, so what I'm going to do is basically uh, walk through with everyone um, and look at the types of the water quality data that are going to be collected in this project. And those are um, really kind of a basic suite of parameters that are often measured to uh, try to get an idea, get a picture, develop a story about um, a watershed. So I'm going to go through and provide a brief definition and description of the data types. And then I'm going to talk about why each data type is important to understand and how it really ties in with understanding stream health. So what are the objectives? Um, well, hopefully at the end of this, folks under, have a better understanding of what data um, really is. And uh, more specifically in terms of the watersheds, um, looking at uh, understanding the health of watersheds and how that is determined. What's, what are the important data types to look at? Um, how do they what do they tell us about the stream? And how do these different data types give us a picture of the watershed and its health? Um, so what is data? What are data? A lot of scientists say, what are data? Data is technically a plural term, but often people use the, use the what is data. Um, so, but, but, but what is data? Is it just numbers? Can it be maps? Can it be photos? Can it be just words? Um, that depends on who you talk to. Some people think of data as just numbers, you know, quantitative information. But in reality, really, data is just information. Okay, so you have information like summary statistics, maps. This is a land use map describing the types of land use in a watershed. This is the um, Darby Creek headwaters area here. Uh, this is continuous data. So it's just one data point after another strung together to show what the uh, different parameters look like in the stream over time. And even photos, this is a little stone fly, um, just collected from the stream by turning over rocks. So it's all information that uh, can help inform your understanding of a, of a stream is what data is. Um, so what is the purpose of data? Well, it really, when it comes down to it, it depends on what your intentions really are. What questions are you interested in answering? What are you really trying to understand? So, um, and that kind of applies to whoever you are, whether you're a scientist who's really delving into the details of a situation or whether you're a volunteer working for a watershed group with certain goals, or whether you're just a person just on your own that's just trying to understand your local watershed or a watershed that you visit or a watershed that you fish or hike in or boat. Um, so it's ultimately simply about um, developing a story or a picture of the watershed. And it really depends on um, what you personally want to know. So um, what types of, going back to sort of the, what types of information, what types of uh, data can be gathered to form this story that you're developing or this picture that you're developing. Um, I'm gonna focus on uh, this, information here. So samples and measurements that you take in the stream. Um, water chemistry is often uh, a parameter that's measured. Stream physical conditions. Darren talked a lot about, you know, eroding banks, riparian zones where, you know, trees are growing or not. Uh, water quantity, Darren touched on quite a bit as well. Flooding and high flows and flashy, so-called flashy flows that um, are associated with urban areas. And impervious surfaces, and then biology. So, um, uh, macroinvertebrates and fish and algae. 
um, and uh, understanding how those change in relation to stream uh, health. And then there's also information about the landscape itself. So Darren went through, talked about watershed boundaries, knowing the watershed boundaries, knowing the paths that the streams take across the landscape, um, understanding the land uses that are associated with the particular watershed and how those change are changing over time, developments, keeping tabs on developments and stuff like that. Road crossings are a big influence. And then uh, point sources like pipes and discharges all are kind of uh, conditions that you look out for on the landscape that can inform your understanding of a watershed. And then very simply, there are just experiential, um, there's experiential information that you can gather just simply by walking a watershed, you know, looking at things with your eyes, walking and biking or driving or boating, just scouring the landscape and just kind of open with an open mind, just looking and seeing what's happening and just allowing questions to arise naturally. Um, so to introduce the Darby Creek Headwaters Monitoring Project, this is the uh, watershed that Darren pointed out. This is the headwater, so there's a lot of watershed downstream of here that is the entirety of the Darby Creek watershed. Um, but this is the area that's going to be monitored. This is a chosen area by Sue and Darren and Lauren because there isn't much data uh, available for this watershed. So Darren and Lauren went through and have uh, decided on sampling sites and we as a group decided on the types of parameters that we would uh, monitor at these sites. So I'm going to go through those parameters and um, I talk about each a little bit. So uh, again, we're, we assemble these parameters, um, these different types of data that we're going to look at so that we can develop a picture of this uh, Darby Creek headwaters area. So we're going to go through here, we're going to go through um, conductivity, we're going to go through temperature, pH, water depth or discharge, the amount of water moving in a stream, total suspended solids and turbidity, macroinvertebrates and fish, and then landscape conditions. And if we have time, um, we might get into uh, just some walking through some just sort of the, of the experiential firsthand uh, viewing with your eyes of the, of the watershed and what that can sort of produce. So what I'm going to do now is just describe each of those parameters in simple terms so that hopefully it's not um, too complex in this short period of time to understand what they're about. And I'm just going to support that with graphs and photos and some other information to support understanding of how each of these parameters relate to stream health. Okay, so conductivity or electrical conductivity is simply a measure of how well the water conducts electricity. That's all it is. And that is directly related to the concentration of ions that are dissolved in the water. So what, what ions are, what materials are dissolved in the water? Well, that can be natural dissolved minerals that are picked up by the water. When it, Darren mentioned when the water falls on the land, it goes into the ground sometimes. And then when it does that, it infiltrates, it passes through the land, and it picks up uh, material as it does that. It kind of forms a T of sorts. That is the dissolved material that's in the water that gives uh, a certain level of conductivity. Now, pollution in many different forms can also cause increased conductivity. So things like road salt, uh, sewage and nutrients and pesticides. Nutrients and pesticides a little less, but they nonetheless will contribute to conductivity levels. Um, so here we have a little uh, table of um, just general ranges of conductivity. So we have pure water, distilled water, very low. Rain or snow, generally pretty low. And then uh, surface water, 50 to 50,000. 50,000 is super, super high because we're getting to sea water there at 50,000 micro siemens per centimeter. That's simply just a measure of how well the water conducts electricity. Um, okay, so why is conductivity important? Well, 
Uh, because it shows pollutants, or at least uh, has the potential to show pollutants, it can serve as a course indicator of stream health. Uh, oftentimes, during pollution spills, those will be reflected in conductivity readings. So you might, you might get a super high conductivity reading during a pollution event or a red flag type event. Um, and conductivity, there's one thing everyone should know is that there's not one silver bullet to understand the health of a watershed. There are certain parameters that are better than others. Um, conductivity is a very good chemistry parameter to get a, a basic idea of a watershed. Um, and lots of folks really kind of rely on that to get a first quick look at uh, the conditions of a watershed. So to put it very basically, um, conductivity is high, generally high in areas with lots of human activity, cities, housing developments, et cetera, and conductivity is low, lower in areas with minimal human activity. Now, again, just to point out, these are general patterns and not, are not always true. There are certainly areas um, of the landscape, even in our, even in our region, where conductivity uh, is naturally high, such as limestone streams, which have uh, substantially higher natural conductivities. And if you didn't know that, you might think that a limestone stream was polluted when it actually has a naturally high conductivity. Um, <clears throat> so, general patterns of conductivity. This is continuous data um, from Angelica Creek in southeastern PA. So this is, this is uh, blue is water depth, orange is conductivity, okay? So one thing that can happen, as I mentioned, with conductivity is you get pulses of pollutants or salts or any number of different things can cause a spike in conductivity. So that's a short-term eleva elevation of conductivity that could be detrimental to organisms or it could not be. Um, you don't really know. I mean, if it's a super, super high spike, then it's likely that it's gonna be toxic. Um, this isn't a real high spike, but it nonetheless is there. So there's something going on. Now, the general pattern, um, when there is a increase in depth, that is when water levels go up, generally uh, conductivity dilutes, it goes down. That's because of what we saw with rain is generally uh, low conductivity. So when that falls on the land and enters the stream, it will cause a dilution effect in the stream. And you can see that as water goes up, water depth goes up, conductivity goes down. Okay. So I mentioned about there are natural levels of conductivity in streams. So here we have Punches Run, which is a highly forested watershed in Noldy State Forest. The average conductivity is about 120 microsiemens per centimeter and the range is about 50 to 150, okay? You can see the trees, you can see the non-eroding banks, all signs that this is a healthy watershed and you can see conductivity is fairly low. Now you go to an urban watershed. This is Rocky Run that drains, uh, it's in Northern Delaware, um, and it drains a highly developed area with a lot of malls and developments and that sort of thing, a lot of impervious surface. This is a parking lot here. This is a concrete channel here. So that's the channel of the stream. The average conductivity in Rocky Run is 1,100 microsiemens per centimeter, and it ranges from 300 to 45,000. So at times in the winter, there are events when salt is applied to this parking lot and other parking lots and roads throughout the watershed and the conductivity spikes up to almost to seawater conditions. So that is not good and it um, is toxic to organisms. So here's another plot of conductivity in an urban watershed is orange and conductivity in a forested watershed is blue. So we've got the, a, a tributary to Cobbs Creek. Darren pointed out where Cobbs is in the Darby Creek watershed. And then there's the east branch of white clay, which is what uh, flows through the Stroud Center property. And you can see 
that the uh, baseline conductivity in the urban watershed is substantially higher, more than twice as high as the forested watershed. We can see these dips, and I bet people can guess what these dips are due to. It is due to dilution during rain events. So if we had a depth plot there on top of this, you would see a depth increase at this same time. Um, so conductivity, as I mentioned, is related to, to salts. Uh, a, a big problem these days is uh, road salt impact on streams. And this is so extensive throughout the country that it is being called the freshwater salinization syndrome. So not only are salts running off the landscape and causing short-term spikes, in uh, streams, but uh, salts are accumulating in the soil and raising base flow uh, conductivity uh, throughout the year. So things like open salt piles. Here we just have a situation in Westchester where salt was applied on the road and then there's a storm drain right next to where that is. So when all this snow melts, it carries that salt directly into the storm drain and it goes directly into the stream. So um, here are conductivity spikes at uh, that same unnamed tributary to Cobbs Creek that uh, Darren monitors. And we see spikes throughout the winter of 2019. So these are all ranging from a couple thousand uh, units of conductivity to up to 20,000. So all of these events are gonna be stressful to organisms in the stream. And you can see that there are multiple super high conductivity readings throughout the winter. And then here we have a graph of simply conductivity uh, among streams throughout the Delaware Basin. And you can see that they range from, you know, kind of in the low 100s up to the thousands. And you could bet that these ones that range higher are in developed areas. And then we have a relationship plot here of conductivity, oops, excuse me, conductivity versus developed land. And you can see as developed land increases, as urban land increases, conductivity goes up. This is highly developed land here, so this is intense uh, urban activity. You can see here, it also just increases as that developed land increases. Okay, so moving on to water temperature. Why is water temperature important? Well, it affects biology, okay? Fish and macroinvertebrates is what we'll focus on here. But uh, as probably I'm guessing a lot of folks know, uh, water temperature is directly related to dissolved oxygen. So uh, DO, as we call it, goes down as water temperature increases. So um, there's going to be less oxygen in the water as water temperature goes up, and that's super important, important for creatures like um, trout. Water temperatures also increase the toxicity of pollutants. Um, and as with conductivity, water temperature does give you sort of a general idea of conditions within a stream. Okay, so uh, Darren mentioned riparian zones. Riparian zone, as most people I'm sure know, is the uh, area right next to the stream. Uh, fully developed riparian zone is uh, trees and bushes. Um, so, and we can see that that has a major effect on stream temperature. So this is a, this is that same stream in um, Rocky Run in Delaware. You can see that summertime temperatures are significantly higher across the board at this stream than at the forested stream. Okay, so this stream could support trout, a sensitive species of fish. This stream could not support trout. So uh, which streams are uh, colder, which streams are warmer? So forested streams are going to be colder. Forested smaller headwater streams are going to be colder. Those are the ones that are going to support trout and other sensitive species. There's also uh, springs, cold water springs, 
that come right out of the ground have cold water and can really influence uh, water temperatures, whether or not they, ha they have riparian zones. So then warmer streams are gonna be ones like, this is again the, un the tributary to Cobbs Creek flowing through a golf course. You can see a few trees, but there's a obviously a lot of area without trees. Slow moving and that, snow that sun just beats down on that water and heats it up. Agricultural areas, see here, there's grazing all the way up to the stream bank. Very few trees, and that sun is just gonna beat down on that water and heat it up very quickly. This is a section of Ridley Creek that Lauren monitors. This is a area that she is planting trees to develop the riparian zone, but right now she has, she has shown temperature increases of one to two degrees in only a couple hundred meters of uh, stream that is not shaded. And then you do get, even if there are, there are uh, uh, trees along the stream, in bigger rivers, you still get sun exposure. So that's where, as you get bigger, you do warm up regardless of whether you have riparian areas. So um, moving on to pH. pH is simply the um, concentration of hydrogen ions in water. Uh, the more hydrogen ions, the more acidic it is. You can see a general range here of uh, acidity, acid to basic. Um, most streams range from six and a half to eight and a half um, pH. However, there are ones that go higher than that. Some of the uh, heavy limestone streams might get up above 8.5, and some of the so called black water streams. Um, often along the coast that have a lot of decaying um, leaves and that sort of thing. There's a lot of tannins create pH conditions that can be five or even lower. Um, so why is pH important? Well, there's certain um, effects on drinking water, acid corrosion, um, deposits on pipes associated with uh, basic conditions. And generally, just acid conditions can be harmful to aquatic life um, and can affect metabolism and usage of nutrients. And also, acidic conditions can mobilize contaminants. So mobilizing metals and um, making certain contaminants more um, available or more uh, uh, exposing biology more to contaminants and toxic things. So moving on, um, here's sort of a basic display of where these different um, creatures uh, can, what different creatures can uh, accommodate in terms of uh, acidic and basic conditions. So as we know, bacteria can, different types of bacteria are wide ranging. Bacteria you find everywhere in all conditions pretty much. Plants and algae, certain more tolerant fish like carp and catfish, and then you're moving into um, some other warm water species like bass and bluegill. And then at the, at the very most sensitive area are these creatures that I've always mentioned, I've already mentioned, such as um, trout and um, certain macroinvertebrates like mayflies and stoneflies and caddisflies have a, have a pretty narrow range of uh, pH conditions that they can tolerate. So um, moving on to water depth, which is a, essentially a surrogate for uh, discharge or stream flow, terms that we use just to characterize the quantity of water moving in a stream. So um, why is water depth important? Well, obviously there are flooding issues, especially in urban areas where um, these uh, streams, as Darren pointed out, with these flashy stream flows where the water quickly rolls off the landscape and enters the stream, it causes big, big pulses of water that create flooding downstream. Um, why else is um, discharge water depth important? Well, uh, it can affect stream banks. Darren pointed out about uh, eroding stream banks and affecting the habitat um, that uh, fish and macroinvertebrates and algae are using. If a flood comes down and starts ripping up the bottom of the stream, that certainly is gonna affect the habitat of bugs living under those rocks. And then it can scour stream banks and remove vegetation, so affecting the riparian zone. 
On the other side of that, there's the low flow conditions that can reduce habitat. It can cause uh, the water to warm. So if you get slower moving water, um, shallower water, it can warm easier. And as we mentioned also, um, that warming temperature can reduce oxygen in the water. Um, and then uh, when the water falls on the land, it can carry whatever pollutants are on the land into the water. So um, scientists often use uh, the amount of water flowing in a stream along with the pollutants that they identify in the stream to talk about how much pollution there actually is in the stream. So Darren mentioned impervious surfaces, which are simply hard surfaces that don't allow the water to get into the ground. That is a big, these, these are a big effect on um, the water flowing in a stream, causing flooding, as I mentioned, destruction to banks and riparian zones and habitat. So what are impervious surfaces? Parks, excuse me, roads, parking lots, roofs, Agricultural fields, to some extent, those are more compacted than uh, the soil in a in a in a woods scenario or in the in the forest, and lawns as well. They can absorb some water, but they are more compacted than uh, a forest a forest floor. And so there is a lot more runoff from lawns than what you would have if you had a if you converted your lawn to um, shrubs and trees. Um, so, talking a little more about impervious surfaces and how that affects water depth. Um, so, impervious surfaces don't allow water to enter the ground. Instead, the rainwater quickly runs into storm drain or across the land and into the nearest stream. So, here we have, again, this tributary to Cobbs Creek that Darren already monitors pretty diligently. Um, and we have two storm drains right here. Here's the stream, here's the storm drains, here's the road. This is all pretty impervious surface around here. So the rain falls on the land and it goes right into these drains and goes directly into the stream. So any oil or salt or any other contaminants that are on the road go right into those drains and flow into the stream. And you get this type of scenario here where it's just ripping through there and tearing out vegetation and carrying pollutants through this section downstream and into the next uh, bigger stream and then the next bigger stream and into the bay. Um, so again, <clears throat> we see uh, a difference between watersheds with impervious surfaces, that is watersheds that are in urban areas or developed areas, residential, commercial areas, compared to a watershed with lots of forest. And we don't necessarily need to worry about where these sit because on, on this axis because the depth is relative, but what we really wanna pay attention to here is the, the uh, severity of these spikes. And we see that, there, that these uh, spikes in water depth at the uh, Cobbs Creek stream are much more dramatic than these spikes we see here on the east branch of the White Clay Creek. So that those spikes are due to the fact that the rain falls on the on the impervious surface and much more quickly gets into the stream causing a much quicker and higher and more extreme flow than what we see in the forested watershed where only some of the water runs off and most of the water actually infiltrates into the ground and does not direct that does not immediately go into the stream. So uh, moving on to turbidity and total suspended solids. So um, this is sort of uh, this is all of the material that's in a stream that is not dissolved. So turbidity is essentially just a measure of how clear or muddy the water is measured in nephilometric turbidity units, um, <clears throat> which you won't, don't really need to be concerned about what that really means, but essentially it's just uh, a measure of how clear the water is. And this is a general range. So you get up in the hundreds and the water looks pretty muddy, pretty brown. Clear water is gonna be, you know, it's good, zero to 10 and the water is gonna look pretty darn clear. 
Total suspended solids are directly related to turbidity. It's just a quantification of that material that is making the water cloudy. So what's done is you just take a sample of water and filter it through a filter and then weigh the filter and that gives you the amount of material that is suspended in that water per unit of water. So we're talking about <clears throat> material like silt and sand. Um, you know, so that, uh, th and those are directly correlated. So the more silt, more sand that is dissolved, that, that is suspended in the water, the, 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 the darker it's going to be, the less uh, able that, that light is going to be able to pass through that water. So why is turbidity and sediment important? Why is turbidity and total suspended solids important? Well, sediment is a stressor itself. It clogs uh, macroinvertebrate habitat. It affects fish spawning and respiration. Um, it also is very important on the land. So agriculture, agriculture loses a lot of soil to um, erosion. And that sediment is carried into, into, excuse me, nearby streams and um, transported downstream for others to deal with. Um, and sediment also carries pollutants. So things like nutrients and metals attach to sediment particles. So on, in agricultural areas, phosphorus, for instance, will attach to particles, and then it will be transported into the stream via erosion, at which point that phosphorus can be mobilized and is often then used by organisms in the stream and affects uh, the situation in the stream. Often there's al big algae blooms in, in relation to transport of phosphorus into streams via uh, erosion of the land. So um, <clears throat> this is a picture from the 2018 annual report uh, from Stroud. This is just a good, and this actually was taken by Carol Armstrong, who this picture was taken by Carol Armstrong, who is actually one of the attendees on this call today. Um, so sediment can wash into the streams from basically any exposed soil. So construction sites, as we see here, you see a lot of construction in our region of southeastern PA. Um, it's very detrimental in storms, especially in these conditions these days when uh, storms are more extreme, uh, more erosion is occurring. So agriculture, pasture lands, and then there's erosion actually in the streams of the stream banks. And we see here that turbidity, this is just a quick graph of um, just showing effects of turbidity on uh, salmonids. So trout type, trout and salmon basically. But we see that essentially what we want to take away from this is the longer that streams are turbid, the longer streams have suspended sediment in them, uh, the more detrimental it's going to be to those creatures living in there. And again, same type of plot here. We're comparing an agricultural watershed to a forested watershed. We see during a single storm, we see that turbidity goes up substantially in the agricultural watershed. And it kind of stays it's just a tiny little hump there in the forested watershed. So the forested watershed, there's very little erosion, very little transport of the sediment into the stream. Whereas in the agricultural watershed, there's exposed soil. There's no riparian zone, and that rain falls and go, runs across the landscape and carries any exposed soil that's there into the stream. This is Manor Creek in Berks County, which is an agricultural watershed, and then Aquashicola Creek, which is a trout stream kind of in the, near the Poconos. Um, so moving on to biology, um, what we want to make sure to mention from the beginning here is that all creatures are affected by their environment, right? So um, macroinvertebrates and fish in particular in streams are often used as indicators. Um, they're in the stream all the time, so their health is going to be affected by any um, chronic stressors or any short toxic um, pulses of material, of pollutants. And uh, it's kind of the same with macroinvertebrates and fish as we see with 
you know, terrestrial things. So we talk, hear about a lot about diversity across the landscape and the importance of diversity and all that and diversity indicating health. So higher diversity equals better stream health. And then there are particular species that are particularly sensitive to pollution. And so often we pay attention to those specific species um, in getting an idea about stream health based on biology. So with regard to macroinvertebrates, um, there are this, the, the so-called EPT species that are the ones that we really pay attention to in terms of understanding stream health in the context of biology. So mayflies, stoneflies, and caddisflies. Ephemeroptera is the order, Lycoptera is the order, Trichoptera is the order. Mayflies, stoneflies, caddisflies. The basic sensitive species that scientists, and anyone really wanting to understand the biology of the stream and how it relates to stream health is gonna pay attention to these species. So it's the idea that these are the canary in the coal mine, okay? So if you find these, if you find these especially in high diversity, you can be almost guaranteed that the stream is in good health. If they're rare, or there's only certain, a few of these, then it makes you question as to whether there is pollution in there. And then you go from there and start trying to determine, well, what is the pollution that is affecting these and causing reduced diversity of these? Mayfly. Stonefly, caddisfly, these are larvae, okay? Mayfly, stonefly, caddisfly, larvae live in the stream. So these are the aquatic um, version, the aquatic stage of, the, uh, of these um, uh, organisms. So the larval stage, this is the, they'll be in there for a year or more in this stage, okay? Um, the adult forms of these creatures are terrestrial and they're much, they're usually shorter, 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 have shorter lives on land. So this is the mayfly. Okay, you see the upright wing. Here's the stonefly, you see the flattened wing, uh, very flat. And then you see the caddisfly here with a flattened wing, but you can also see that it's sort of wedge-shaped. It's a characteristic of the adult caddisfly. Okay. And then the other biology that people often look to for understanding the health in streams are fish. Again, the canary in the coal mine type concept. So trout, okay. All types of trout are, are sensitive. Now, there are variabilities among these species in terms of sensitivity, but for our purposes here today, they're all sensitive. And then we have other species. These are just examples, but long nosed days, American brook lamprey, people think lampreys are kind of nasty creatures, but these freshwater lampreys are actually very sensitive to pollution, and you only find them in streams that are forested. Um, and then the shield darter. So darters and sculpins and that type of thing are also very sensitive. And I'm going over my time limit here, so I'm not sure how long we can keep going. I wanted to show this picture just to make people aware about fish in our neck of the woods. Trout, the only trout that is native to our region, in fact, the only non-migratory trout that is native to all of Eastern North America is the brook trout. Yeah. Dave, I'm sorry to interrupt you. Um, we are going to be running out of time soon. Yeah. If you could just uh, quickly go through the last or sum up some of the things, and then we'll open it up for questions if anyone has any questions. Yes, I, I, am at, I am at the end here. There's, oh, okay. there's the landscape conditions and that type of thing, but I was kind of going to leave that to just how long this whole thing took. So I can leave those out and maybe just use those for additional comments. So um, that's where we are. So I'm fine to stop right there. Okay, great. So those, Thank those, you. So those are the basic uh, parameters that will be monitored um, through the Darby Creek headwaters.
project. And um, I wanted to just, I'll get to the end here and return to this map and pass it off to Lauren, who's gonna go into more detail about um, these sites. And I'll pass to, I will stop my sharing and pass off to Lauren. All right, Lauren, before you start, I just wanted to let people know that um, if you have any questions, we are going to open it up at the end for uh, questions and conversation. Um, but if you have a question, um, you can either unmute yourselves or there is a chat that is being monitored. Um, I just want to take a quick minute to see if anybody might have a, a quick question, um, since that was a lot that was just really given. All right, um, on to Lauren, thank you. All right, hey everyone, I'm Lauren from Willistown Conservation Trust. Can you hear me? We're good? Yes. Yep. Beautiful, <laughs> thank you. Um, so I'm going to switch gears a little bit from um, a lot of this awesome discussion around um, parameters and land use and kind of switch now into the, like what, what we're hoping to do with this monitoring project. Um, so give me one second to share my screen. Um, and while I am doing this, I will let you know I'm the director of the Watershed Protection Program at Willistown Conservation Trust. That might be important. Um, so I want to take a minute to really acknowledge how awesome it is that we have this truly collaborative project. Um, Darby Creek Valley Association and Stroud um, have been awesome partners and it's really exciting to see everything starting to come together. So DCVA is really working on a lot of the project guidance and volunteer management um, and Stroud has been instrumental in keeping us on task and developing this project to be as efficient and effective as possible with everyone's time. Um, and Willistown, so my role is going to be more with the data analysis side of things. So we'll get into that um, in a little bit, but uh, just it's really cool to see um, how much can be done with a really good group of collaborators. So if you're wondering what a land trust is doing with two other watershed organizations, um, I understand, but Willistown Conservation Trust um, has our, the newest program is the Watershed Protection Program, which has only been around since 2017 through a, um, and established through a generous grant from the William Penn Foundation. At its core, um, this has been mentioned in several or both presentations so far, uh, water quality depends on healthy habitat on land. Um, and so that's something we take really seriously at Willistown. Um, and I know our partners do too. And so in the Watershed Protection Program, we've been monitoring water quality on a monthly basis um, since January of 2018 in Ridley Crumb and Darby Creeks. Um, so we're excited to get to expand our reach and get a better understanding of the Darby Creek headwaters. The overall goals for this project, um, we've been talking a lot about all of these different conditions and stressors on Dogby Creek, and we really want to get a better understanding of how that's all of this development and impervious surface and high flow rates are impacting the health of our waterways. And by understanding the stressors of our stream, we can start to better move forward to improve the habitat and decrease the impact of our terrestrial behaviors on our um, aquatic systems. If you have questions about any of this, throw it into the chat. Um, I'm going a little quickly, so um, let me know if I'm being unclear. So back to this map that Dave already introduced. Um, this, so the project that we're talking about is only really focused right now on the headwaters of Darby Creek. But the goal, I think, for the very long term is to be able to expand this kind of volunteer monitoring program where we have a team of people collecting high quality data all the way down through Darby Creek. But for now, we've got our work cut out for us just in the headwaters. So we did some legwork as um, Dave introduced, and I believe Darren introduced, um, identifying potential sampling sites. Um, I, my program monitors one site in Darby Creek, and that's this 
downstream site at Waterloo Mills. Um, and the reason we picked all of these confluences or um, meeting of streams was to be able to effectively do detective work, right? To figure out if, say, this site at Mary's Tributary is really, really degraded, but pump station three looks okay, there's good quality water, then we can start moving our way upstream to start identifying where the problems are occurring. Um, when we first started identifying sites for sampling, we noticed there were a couple really good ones at the uh, mainline YMCA. So we approached them to talk about potentially partnering, especially with their Youth Earth Service Corps program, which is a group for young students um, to learn more about their environment and to make the world a better place. And so it just seemed like a really good fit to get these young, creative, energetic um, people to help us um, by using their education programming to start our monitoring effort. Um, so the plan was, before the health crisis put us into quarantine, um, was to meet with these students, train them how to collect and preserve their samples and to gather some of this data that we've been talking about, providing a hands-on experience in water quality research. Um, but unfortunately, everything had to be canceled, but we're hoping that um, the Upper Mainline YMCA Youth Earth Service Corps program is going to be joining us um, in our volunteer efforts. So data collection, right? What does this mean for you? We've talked a lot about this wide variety of different types of data and the story it can tell. Um, but our plan is to have a monthly collection at each of the sites um, on the previously shown map. And collection includes grabbing a water sample and looking at certain data points that Dave has already done a beautiful job introducing. Things like temperature, pH, salinity, depth, and conductivity. Um, if you're interested in volunteering, we will happily provide the equipment and the training. Um, so it's, it's a really exciting time to be part of this because this is pretty new. Um, but I'm going to walk you through a pretty cheesy day in the life of a water scientist after I introduce to you the uh, equipment. So the first thing um, is going to be a conductivity meter. Right, so Dave talked about the importance of conductivity as a kind of catch-all for water impairment. Um, so this is really easy to use. You just, uh, it comes with a little tearaway pack um, to calibrate. So you just calibrate the equipment before you go out to the field or when you're in your car, and then you go ahead and just stick it in the stream and get the reading. So it's very easy to use um, and very straightforward, but maybe not as straightforward as just a thermometer. Um, Water temperature is so important. And when we visit monthly, we capture the opportunity to see seasonal changes. Um, so we really, you know, everyone is familiar with what a thermometer is, not, not too complicated. An algae bottle, it's, um, this is for collecting a water sample. It's got a wide mouth for easy collection. Um, and I'll go over kind of very briefly the way we collect a water sample. Spoiler, it's not, not scary or hard. Um, but this is really critical because the uh, total suspended solids um, and turbidity analysis are going to be taking place off-site. So we need to take the water with us. Chloride strips, um, these are, uh, there's a nice graduated face on it and there's a color change that takes place on the strip to tell you what the concentration of chlorides approximately is in your stream. Um, so we use this in coordination with our conductivity sampler. pH strips, if you have a fish tank or a pool, I'm sure you've seen these before. And again, it's just a color indicator um, to give us a, an idea of what the pH is at the given moment. And it's important that pH and chlorides are analyzed at the site of the stream or immediately after collecting because pH in particular is dependent on temperature. So if you take a sample and you put it in the fridge that might be cooler than the water, your pH might start to change. So you have to have a cup so you can test it on site. Um, you may not have graduated beakers and that's fine. It, it's just going to be some sort of clean container to scoop water from the stream to use your uh, indicator strips. And then on site, there's going to be a couple of different pieces of equipment. Um, the first is a temperature logger, which is 
amazing technology these days is so cool and i say that as the millennial that it just keeps getting cooler and cooler um these loggers um you can program them to take continuous readings so every five minutes or every hour however you're you feel um you need to see the data and what makes it special is that you can download an app and then get the data via Bluetooth so you don't need to get into the water and pull it out and worry about slipping and falling or dropping the computer in if you're trying to log the data. So just your phone, you shouldn't have to get in the stream, very easy. A little more complicated um, are the water depth loggers. This um, equipment will likely be only at Three different sites it requires a secondary piece to hook to it to get the data so when it's time to collect the, um, the information off of those loggers Darren or I will likely be with you at that time so um, this isn't too too much to lo lug with you to any of the sample sites um, but it gives us a really wide berth of understanding of what's happening in the waterways so you made it to the site, you're a volunteer, thank you. Um, what happens when you get there? So hopefully you're with a partner um, and you're gonna bring your field pack out. And maybe the first thing is, is you put your thermometer in the water, it takes a couple of minutes to get an accurate reading. And when that's happening, you can fill up your beakers so you can get your conductivity and pH data. Um, as that's happening, you can take your calibrated conductivity meter and get a reading, it only takes a couple of seconds. Um, and then log all of that data onto the provided data sheets. While all of this is taking place, you know, be sure to be looking around, using your eyes, your nose, all of your different senses to see what it's like in the waterway. Is there algae growing like crazy in the stream? Does it smell like flowers? Is something blooming nearby? Is there a dead thing? Um, you know, is there sewage? All of these things need to be written down on the data sheets because it gets difficult, especially when you visit so regularly, to keep in mind when all of these changes are taking place. So, just something to always have in the back of your mind. Um, you need to collect your water sample, and it's so important to record the when, the where, and the who, right? So, what sample site were you at? the date and the time are really, really critical. So a bunch of the graphs that Dave showed um, had these like peaks and dips that occurred over a daily basis. So um, things can really change between the morning and the evening. So we need to know the, the time that you were collecting your sample. Now, to collect the sample is very easy, but you need to rinse your container out first, right? So triple rinse your container. And this is a colleague of mine, uh, Regan Maldome, who is showing excellent field form for rinsing and filling a container. So you always fill upstream and then dump behind you downstream. So you fill, tap, shake, and dump three times before you can fill up your sample. It's a really, it feels silly, it feels unnecessary, but it's so, so important, especially when we're working um, with things like total suspended solids. You don't wanna be recollecting any of the gunk that you just rinsed out of your hand. So after you've collected your sample, you've got it on ice or in the fridge until it can come to me, or maybe we can analyze it together. Um, you wanna be sure to document your sites. So take lots of pictures of what field conditions look like because sometimes changes in stream banks can be very slow to occur, and other times they can be really fast. So it's important um, to always be taking loads of pictures so you have a memory of what was happening in the stream three months ago, six months ago. And then while your phone's out, grab that quick data logger data. Um, and, then, and then that's it. So an average site should take maybe between 15 or 30 minutes, which by itself doesn't feel like a big ask, but we're at really hoping that we can do this on a monthly basis. Um, so if you're interested in doing that kind of work, uh, let us know because we really want to build a Cracker Jack team um, so we can really have this high quality data coming together so we can be really, you know, use it in an effective way. So we're talking about collecting all this data 
and getting an idea of what's happening in the stream on any given day. So our baseline, what's happening on a normal Tuesday in March? Who knows? Let's find out because we don't have that data set yet. Once we build it, we are going to be using this, the story that all of this data is telling us to make best recommendation or recommendations for best management practices. So if we find out that there's a certain tributary that's seen really big spikes in chlorides and conductivity in the wintertime, we could go to the township or landowners and talk to them about how to make better changes. And ideally, in the long run, we'll be able to continue to collect after and during we're making these changes and see if the recommendations we're making are having a measurable impact on our water quality. So it doesn't sound like much, right? It's only three things, but those three things take place, you know, potentially over a long period of time. Um, so this is a really exciting project because um, there isn't really this kind of data for the headwaters and we're just starting to roll it out. So it's always exciting to be part of, you know, the very first round of data collection. So um, we're really excited about the potential of this project to make really big impacts for the headwater areas and have long lasting benefits for our downstream neighbors. Um, so if you're seeing all of this and you're like, oh my gosh, that sounds great. I can't wait. Sign me up today. Awesome. If you're on the other side of that coin and maybe not so sure if this, if this is kind of a big ask, maybe you don't have that kind of time to, to dedicate to going out once a month, that's okay. Um, we just want everyone to feel a connection to their waterways. So we have several upcoming webinars um, that ideally would be in person, but thank goodness that the plague is hitting and during the digital age so we can still reach out and connect. Um, so we're planning on having a series um, covering a lot of the topics that were introduced today. Um, on next Thursday, we'll be talking about macroinvertebrates, which are my jam. So if you want to learn more about things like stoneflies and mayflies and caddisflies, right? Um, all of the insects that Dave introduced, you did part of the work for me. Thanks, Steve. Um, we'll be talking more about that for, you know, a half hour, 45 minute gathering um, next Thursday at lunch. And the following week, Dave's going to be talking about Monitor My Watershed and how you can get to know your waterways more effectively through um, this online data portal. Plus, we're going to have a digital stream walk, lectures on fishes and riparian buffers, how to identify stressors in the waterways. So lots of cool things are coming up on the horizon. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. So if, if you don't want to be a volunteer, that's, that's okay. Please continue to sign up for things and learn more and just become more connected with these amazing resources that we have in our backyards. So that's everything for me. Um, if you are interested in joining us on this project, um, please contact Sue Miller. Her contact information is on the top of the screen. Um, and if you have questions about any of the things that each of the uh, presenters have introduced and they come up later, um, you know, feel free to contact each of us uh, via our email. We're always happy to chat with people um, about the work that we do and love. So with that, thank you all for, for listening and for joining in today. And I'd love to open everything up to questions. Right, Sue? Yeah, sorry, I was muted. Um, yes, if anyone has any questions uh, specifically for any of the uh, presenters um, or just general questions about other things that we're working on, um, as Lauren and Darren and David all mentioned, um, most of our uh, program right now is up in the headwaters. However, we do have a few programs going on in the lower watershed and we would like to get more going. Um, basically, it has to do with uh, volunteers and, and funding, of course. But um, as things become available and develop, we will be moving downstream um, into the lower part of the watershed. Um, the reason why we started in the headwaters is because we literally have almost no data up in the headwaters. And as you know, everything rolls downstream. So we wanted to figure out what's going on at the top 
and where we can make changes and help things from going even further downstream. So right now, if you, you have two options, you can either unmute yourself, you can unvideo yourself if you want to uh, present, you know, so we can see your face, so we can get an idea who you are, um, or you can raise your hand and go into chat. Does anyone have any questions? Sue, I got a couple of questions from someone who just sent them to me privately. <clears throat> One question was, what are the adjacent watersheds to Darby Creek? So to the west, we have Ridley Creek. And to the east, we have Mill Creek. And just about everything to the east of us drains over into the Schuylkill River for more watershed context there. And then are there stormwater pipes and sewage pipes connected to Darby Creek's watershed? There are miles and miles and miles of stormwater pipes that discharge directly into Darby Creek. And our uh, largest named tributary, Cobbs Creek, has 13 combined sewer overflows that discharge untreated stormwater into the creek when we get about, I think the, the first one that starts to flow raw sewage into the creek is when we get about a quarter of an inch of rain. So a quarter of an inch on up, it's raw sewage discharging into uh, Cobbs Creek. And Philadelphia is working on addressing that. And then the other question he um, had was, his watershed is Naylor's Run, and he wanted to know if we had any information on Naylor's Run. And as a matter of fact, we have a one of those enviro DIY meters, like the one that you saw in the golf course that I monitor and maintain, we have one of those over on Naylor's Run at about the same watershed position, pretty far down in the watershed. So that one, like the one that I monitor and maintain, are available 24-7 via a uh, web link that we can send out to everyone where you can look at current within the last 72 hours what the flow is, what the, or what the water depth is, what the temperature is, the conductivity, and the turbidity is. And then you can look back, all the way back to the first date when it was installed. So for the one that I monitor, that was uh, the day after Thanksgiving in 2017. So there's a long, well, relatively speaking for me, that's a long uh, group of data on what's been going on in that stream. Um. Thank you, Darren. Um, two things. Uh, David just uh, put the oh, link into the chat link in the chat area if anyone wants to go directly over to that. Um, I can also send out some information for you. Um, I had a question from Dale Harris. What is the effect of litter on our watershed? Oh, I can speak to that. Plastic pollution is one of my passions and not in a great way um but all of the trash that washes i'm I actually know that some of you might have heard me lecture on this before but all of the trash that washes into our waterways continues moving and it breaks down and becomes smaller and smaller and it can be eaten by insects and bugs and it's causing a lot of a lot of problems choking up you know stormwater pipes and things like that um so I think each of our organizations is working in different ways to help decrease the amount of litter. If it's, you know, DCBA typically would be holding an amazing stream cleanup like this week. Um, but unfortunately that had to be canceled because, due to the group gathering. But it's up to, I think, a lot of individuals are working on, you know, picking up a piece of trash every time they're out walking. If you see anything on the side of the road or on a trail, um, pick it up because it will it will wash into the waterways. It will be oftentimes consumed or it can trap organisms in it um, that can lead to them passing away. So litter is a nefarious problem, um, especially in our area as the headwaters. We pass it all downstream to the Delaware and eventually to the Bay. So thank you, Lauren. Um, Carol Armstrong, um, you have a very long question. I was wondering if you could unmute and ask the question. That way I don't have to read it off. If that's okay. Sure. Hi. So, um, 
David said that um, e-conductivity measures dissolved ions in the water. And I'm unclear whether it can measure hydrophobic chemicals like heavy metals. So hydrophobic would suggest that it's not being dissolved. So is it only measuring the dissolved ions? It, it's measuring dissolved ions, but I mean, you know, like you mentioned what lead and arsenic would, yeah. would be dissolved. No, they're not. They're, they're hydrophobic and they won't dissolve in water. So, so if they're in the sediment, um, which is what I, I think might be part of the question, Carol, um, this is only for what's happening in the water column. So we're not doing sediment cores or any sort of like gathering in that way. Um, to, to test for those things. That's a separate um, analysis that would need to be done. Right, so, so e-conductivity is not measuring, for example, arsenic and lead. I do not believe so. It's only measuring the free ions. So metals aren't um, ionic in that way, if that makes sense. Really pushing oh. my chemical Thank understanding you. right now. Okay, thank you. <laughs> yeah, I mean, lead does conduct electricity. So, I mean, I guess that's what I was getting at, but um, I guess Could it's you... not technically dissolved in the water. Um, am I on, sorry, I think I might not be, I might be in. I'm yeah, you're, on, you're good, Dave. Oh, okay. We can hear you. Thought I thought I was muted. Um, arsenic, Carol, I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm kind of the same as Lauren. I'm not sure specifically about arsenic. Um, yeah, I'm just, I'm just trying to sort out for myself um, how far e-conductivity can go in helping us understand the pollutants in the stream. And I think that it's just going to be very limited to um, the, the parts of pesticides that are dissolvable, et cetera, the parts well, and of I, I think more, that are dissolvable. I think more, more beyond that, it's, the, it's going to be the concentration of those those things that are dissolved or are conducting electricity because even though pesticides would generally be as i understand it would ge or nutrients would generally be dissolved i mean some nutrients aren't dissolved because they're stuck on the sediment or whatever but um <clears throat> those as i understand it are, are generally not going to be in concentrations high enough to usually like show dramatic changes in conductivity, if that, if that makes sense. So even though they are contributing to conductivity, you know, if you get a, if you get some, a nutrient input, it, depending on how super big it is, it may or may not even show up in sort of the, the conductivity readings, if that makes sense. Yes, thank you. Um, okay, um, Pam asked, are we taping this and will we share it with others? Um, I believe it is being taped, um, David. I don't know if you'll have the master. Yeah, I'll have it. It is being recorded and I'm still recording right now. Okay, great. Um, and then if you could get me that link or um, download it for me and then I can distribute it to um, the people that signed up for the um, workshop. Yep. Um, the next question is from Anthony. Um, Bastian, uh, when we clean, when we do the DCVA cleanup, what percentage of the watershed are we covering? I can answer that one. Um, the DCVA cleanup, we have sites cleaned up um, from in all four counties. From in Chester County, we have five locations. Delaware County, we have numerous, numerous locations. We have a few in um, Lower, Lower Marion, in Montgomery County, and then we have some in the Philadelphia region. Uh, we're trying to grow it every year. The more volunteers we have, the more of the stream we can clean. Right now, um, well, last year we had, I believe, 52 locations running from Chester, all, Chester County all the way down to the John Hines. Does that, um, I hope that answer. Percentage, I can't give you an actual percentage, just we do are spread out throughout the watershed. Um, yeah. a question? You're breaking up. No, you're still breaking up. Maybe you can type it. 
Um, uh, Anthony asks, are areas of the creek adopted and cleaned up year round? We do have some private uh, volunteers that do clean up around the areas. Um, you know, the more that we could get you know, would be the would be great. Um, but the matter of just trying to find the volunteers to sign up and being willing to do that. Um, there are different um, local community groups that have taken on specific little areas that they're working on. And many of the public spaces too, I know that township managers um, usually have people helping clean up um, parks and preserves. Um, but I think especially now when, you know, a lot of these cool, large, big impact volunteer opportunities are being postponed and canceled, um, that taking the initiative to pick up, you know, every time you go outside, one or two pieces of trash over the year could lead up to the same kind of impact as having like one of these big stream cleanups. Okay, I see a lot of trash. We can report it to some government. Okay, Anthony asks um, if we see a lot of trash, can we report it to some government agency? Absolutely. Um, First, if you see it actually happening, excuse me, at the time, everybody has a cell phone nowadays, take a picture, get a license plate, because um, we do have a lot of illegal dumping, especially in the lower watershed, um, and you know, report it at the time. And yes, call 911, call the police, if you see it happening immediately. If you come and have a, you know, to a site that has been previously dumped and it's there, um, you need to contact the uh, code officer of that municipality. Um, other organizations, you can also contact me if you're not sure who to contact. Um, DCBA is going to be rolling out a program soon called the Environmental uh, Watchdog, in which we are going to um, help people be able to direct them on who to contact, who not to contact, what to look for um, as far as what type of trash is there or leakage or oil or at construction sites if they don't have a silt fencing and it rains and all the silt is going directly into the stream. Um, but there's also the DEP, EPA, depending on what type of uh, trash or pollutant is being dumped. Okay. Um, Pam asks, are there any techniques or practices in place to cut down on the salt runoff from snow treatment? Um, that's open to any of the speakers if they want to answer. Lauren, you so want to go so ahead? This is Darren. Sorry. Yeah. Go ahead, Darren. There are a number of municipalities in some of these heavily urbanized areas that put down brine, which is a whole lot less chloride being put into the system than we do if we go out and dump piles and piles of salt to try and address the snow as it's falling. So yes, there. That's at this point, that's all we have. Um, I'm hopeful that as we continue with this program and we continue to educate folks, we'll get them to understand that when you have a dusting of an inch of snow, it's better to go out with a broom and brush it off your sidewalk than to walk out, pitch a bunch of salt on the sidewalk and jump in your car and go to work because you've probably applied way too much salt. Um, oh, I'm sorry, Lauren, go ahead. Sorry. There's also, so the, the salt that's a really big problem right now is the sodium chloride. Um, so there are alternatives that are for the time being um, slightly less harmful to our aquatic systems, things like magnesium chloride, like uh, I think it's called PawSafe, 
it is though much more expensive so if cost is an issue for for you but you are concerned an opportunity um is to you can use normal salt and then sweep it up when you're done so it doesn't continue to just leach into the soil and into the waterways um i know that there is a, a big concern like safety of people is just as important more important in some cases than the safety of our aquatic system. So um, using normal road salt and then clearing it up, it saves you money because you can reuse it again over and over and over. Um, and it saves, saves our environment while reducing some of the ice that builds up. So lots one of thing, opportunities. One thing um, I could also mention is um, people are, some some folks, especially in these more snowy areas, are using um, actual physical removal, uh, snow removal techniques that are better at just scraping snow off the snows. They call them these live edge plows that they use on the um, trucks. And those are basically plows that um, are sort of, they use the term live because they they contour to the road surface and get a better, get a, better complete uh, clean of the snow off of the roads, meaning there needs to be less salt uh, applied to actually get the roads clean. Um, one of the other things I want to mention is uh, we are monitoring salt. I am going to be putting up a workshop video um, with a few, hopefully, um, other people that would like to join. Um, that talks about the actual salt itself, um, different mechanisms, and how we're monitoring it. And our monitoring salt monitoring program, you can monitor, it doesn't have to be at our said locations that we're normally monitoring. You can monitor it and upload your data, and I'll get into that um, during the program. Um, even if you have a creek in your backyard, down the street, you can um, go out there, and what we like to see is um, to start getting a baseline before a storm, even in the summertime, because as Dave mentioned, we're still getting salt runoff in the summer because of the leftover salt that has been washed into the soils and surrounding areas in the ground. So um, what we like to have started to say is what we like to see is a, a little bit of a baseline and then Right as the storm starts, I'm not saying go out under a torrential downpour or a blizzard, but we like to get it like right as the water starts to hit the stream so we can get that first flush coming in. And then after that, um, where in the winter time, where you have um, the first melt, where you know it's frozen and then it melts because that gets you another wash of salt so we can get the how much salt is going into that particular area of stream and then um darren um or dave lauren anyone what the third one is what like a week out to see if it returns to baseline is that the correct do you know um what did you say sue <laughs> <laughs> the the that you get you get it um four times. You get it, well, before the storm, during the storm, right after the first melt, and then again later as it melts or after the storm. You mean you're talking about when you measure like chloride with a strip or something? Mm -hmm. Yes, um, for the salt watch, the winter oh, salt for watch. The, oh, for the, oh, okay, you're talking about for specifically for the salt watch. Yeah, yeah. I, sorry, I, I can't specifically speak to that. It seems like it would make sense that you're doing it before, during, and after, but I don't know the specific protocol. Okay. Yeah, sorry. I have that. Um, I'm working on that uh, presentation now, so um, I will send it out if um, to your email addresses if you signed up for this program and also if you can check our website and we'll have it listed for uh, the date and time. Mm -hmm. um, does anyone else have another question? Let me see. All right, okay. Bill needed to leave. Um, Peter Hickman, he wanted to do a stream monitoring program or two streams in the Haverford Reserve. Who do we contact? Um, 
Peter, awesome news. Um, DCBA just got a $500 grant in order to get some equipment that is going to be used in, and Aurora is heading up our uh, volunteer portion of that in Havertown. Um, we have not specifically picked our location yet. I know that we are looking at um, downstream from the Whetstone Run to get some uh, data, some uh, baseline data there so that if that property does get developed, we know the impact of it. Um, and there are a few others, um, but Darren needs to look at the site locations to figure out where we are doing it. Um, but you can contact either myself um, or Aurora at this time uh, to see, you know, where, where we are on that. And we will have a updated, um, like mini workshop or meeting just to talk about the areas in Haverford since we can't get together as a group right now. Yeah, it will, it will just be a capacity related thing. If we have a volunteer who can give a day a month, we can probably do upwards of a dozen locations over the course of a day, depending on how intensively we want to monitor each one of those. So, shortly we're going to have the equipment then the next limiting step will be to have the uh, volunteer or two it's usually better if you have a team so that you can say up oh, something's come up pass the meter to someone else to go and do the uh, sampling um, does anyone else have any questions or would like to make a comment um, please feel free to either top tap and uh, type it into the chat, or if you would like to unmute and just ask a question, if you can do that. Um, also, Lauren had uh, put up, Lauren, actually, can you share that again one more time? Um, our contact information, um, if you wanna contact any of us for any other questions. And um, Sue, so once Lauren puts that up, I noticed um, my email address actually has a D before my the Bressler, it's just up there as Bressler at Stroud, but it's actually D Bressler at Stroud Center. So maybe Lauren, you could maybe even just change that right now. That is exactly what I am doing. Oh yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I'm so slow with the Zoom. So, um, okay, so there's the information. Um, if you're interested in volunteering, um, like right now, um, we are going to be, we have the uh, funds to start doing, I believe, four locations or maybe six locations up in the Headwaters, which is in the Berwyn, and one is in the Newtown Square area. If um, you're interested in doing that, just um, send me a quick email and we'll make, you know, we can get together on virtual meeting and talk about um, in more detail a few things. Also, um, in the lower areas, um, I did reach out to a few of your EACs and municipalities. Um, we do have a grant that we're waiting to hear from for equipment um, so we can expand the program. Um, but if you're interested, please send me an email on, you know, that you're interested, what location, what township, municipality you're in, um, and your full contact information, please. Um, does anyone else have any other questions? Let's give them a minute. Okay. Um, so then I guess uh, we will conclude um, our workshop for today. And we hope that you will sign up for the upcoming ones. And if you would like to volunteer, please let us know. Anybody else? All right. Thank you very much. Have a good day. Thanks. Great. Thanks, Sue. Thank you all. Bye. Bye.